welcome here to Chestnut Chat. Um, at this edition, we're going to be talking about planting American chestnuts, like literally taking chestnuts, either chestnut seeds uh, or chestnut plants and putting them in the ground uh, in various ways. Um, the for format for today is going to be a little different. We're going to play around with uh, a slightly different way of presenting information um, because in January we had a really good and we were able to do some videos. Uh, we're going to do a video, a lot of videos today. Um, I'm going to have a little thing at the end where I'll talk about overwintering, but for the most part, uh, the people here on the screen are going to be doing, um, uh, presenting their videos. Uh, Margie or Margie, thanks for coming in from New Hampshire. Yeah, I, I do love it. We haven't done that in a while of, of sharing where all we're from. So if you guys want to throw that in the chat, do love to see the the breadth of people and where they're from. And I don't know, maybe Jamie will show up and, and throw in, maybe she could win the, the farthest away. Um, but uh, I got distracted. Um, I'm Sarah Fitzsimmons. I work with the American Chestnut Foundation. I am, I have the pleasure of being joined today with a bunch of folks here from TACF. Um, Kendra is up in our uh, Burlington office with the U.S. Forest Service and UVM. Uh, Cassie is at the Virginia Department of Forestry in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Hal is joining us uh, from Asheville, North Carolina. Sierra and Vasily are joining us. Um, it may not be this way in your screen, but it is on mine. Um, uh, Metaview, Virginia at our Metaview Research Farms. Uh, and then Lake Grabowski is, uh, he's not at Penn State right now, but he's nearby and he's our new um, Northern Appalachian Regional Science Coordinator. And then Catherine briefly shared her screen and then, and then went away. Um, there she is, is joining us from Albany, New York. So we've got a pretty wide variety of folks joining us. Um, so a uh, little bit of housekeeping. If you have, uh, ah, Oregon, very cool. Um, if you have a chat or some witty banter that you want to add to the conversation, please put that in the chat. If you have a question, put that in the Q&A and the folks here primarily will, will work to answer those. Um, the way that we're going to work uh, this chestnut chat, like I said, is we're going to have a lot of videos. Um, Hal is going, Hal has done an incredible job editing these videos together, putting some some nice triangle based music, not xylophone based music, um, into into the mix. And what we're going to do is each person is going to join, is going to uh, introduce their section. We'll watch the video of that section, then we'll take a pause and we'll answer some questions based on that specific technique. So, um, Hal, can you remind me of what the order of everything is of the different uh, techniques we're going to talk about today? Yes, we are starting out with Jamie talking about stratification. Then we have Sierra talking about planting seeds in containers. Then we have Kendra talking about planting seeds in the ground, in the field. We have Vasily talking about planting your containerized seedlings in the field. And then we have Cassie and John talking about planting bare root seedlings in the field. And then Sarah is gonna do cleanup crew. I'll do cleanup talking about how to overwinter seedlings and and I'm going to buck the trend of videos because I have a, a face for Zoom and I'm going to just present uh, a normal PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation. So I think with that, um, I don't know how Jamie's not here. I didn't ask you to do this. So my apologies. But uh, would you mind introducing Jamie's segment um, and then uh, share the video? Sure, no problem. So Jamie Van Cleef is the Southern Regional Science Coordinator at the American Chestnut Foundation. And she is going to be talking about how to prepare your chestnut seeds for planting. Um, and the main thing she's discussing is stratification. And you are about to find out what stratification is if you're not familiar with it. Jamie does an awesome job explaining it. So let's jump right in, shall we? Hello everyone and happy Chestnut Chat. My name is Jamie Van Cleef and I am the Southern Regional Science Coordinator for the American Chestnut Foundation. Today I'm going to be talking to you guys about stratification and how to properly stratify your American chestnuts. For those who don't know, stratification is the process of mimicking uh, natural conditions that allow for proper seed dormancy uh, to allow for successful germination. Seed dormancy is a very common defense mechanism among seeds, including our chestnuts. 
Um, it allows seeds to wait out unfavorable conditions for more optimal ones. In the case of chestnuts, we are talking about the winters that we have here on the East Coast. If you think about it, chestnuts are done and developed in the fall. If they were to continue to grow in the fall, we would have these very vulnerable seedlings facing our fairly harsh winters that we have here. So by having this dormant seed period, they're allowed to wait out the cold and come back out in the spring when things are better and more optimal for their growth. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, us humans like to go out and collect chestnuts. We may eat quite a few of them, but we also want to keep quite a few for growing. But we've taken the chestnuts out of their natural conditions and put them in an artificial one. So now we need to think about how we can make these artificial conditions ideal and match some of the natural conditions these chestnuts may have. So stratification uh, involves three things. It requires a certain duration of time with a ideal temperature and moisture conditions. So let's get into the specifics of our friend, the American chestnut. Well, dormancy, I take somewhere around 40 to 60 days. This can vary quite a bit, um, but that is a very safe range. The American and Chinese chestnut can have a bit of variation between them. Um, that said, once you have uh, the ability to store them for that period of time, you really want to think about the temperature. This is probably the, one of the most important things. Dormancy can happen even in high temperatures, but at a cold temperature, you are going to allow, you're going to set up your chestnuts for the most success. If you do not put your chestnuts at a cold temperature, you increase mortality of your chestnuts significantly. There are also some other great benefits of keeping your chestnuts in cold storage. Um, one of the big ones is prevention of two things, which is root rot and also mold. Um, of course, these cold temperatures do not prevent these entirely, but they will greatly reduce the likelihood of them happening. One of the other big advantages, and probably for me, one of the most important advantages, is the flexibility that this cold storage allows you. In cold storage, you may be able to extend the period of dormancy, which allows you a little bit of flexibility as to when you go out and plant chestnuts. It'll also slow down the growth of radicals that come off of chestnuts. In warmer temperatures, you may see a radical like this, it's quite long and it has a cute couple of uh, feeder shoots. In this case, it was actually so long that it broke in storage. This was the, the nut that it came from. Of course, this means this chestnut may still survive and grow, but this will greatly reduce the growth and overall success of this chestnut. So by keeping it in a cold storage, you can slow down the radical growth and maybe get something like this. Of course, you may get no radical at all, and the chestnut will still likely grow and be successful. But this is a very good indication um, that the chestnut was stratified and will grow correctly and will also emerge a little bit faster than those without the radicals. So now you have a bunch of chestnuts, you've harvested them, and you want to start getting ready to stratify them. Well, I would first start looking at your fridge. Your fridge is a great place to store chestnuts. It may not be as precise as some of um, the RSC's equipment or, or maybe your university's equipment, but keeping them in that fridge temperature is more than sufficient. The one thing that you want to avoid is freezing the chestnuts because that might unfortunately um, reduce germination of your seeds. So make sure you have a consistently cold temperature. You can reach out to your RSC and see if they have room in their facility, or again, just use your fridge. Um, once you've verified that you do, in fact, have some storage space, I'd go ahead and find a bag. Make sure you label it. I know this seems silly, and this doesn't really have to do with stratification, but it's so very important. Make sure you have the cross information, the number of seeds, and also other crucial information that you may need. I'd go ahead and poke a couple of bags in the hole. If there are enough chestnuts, you do not need to put peat moss as there will be enough moisture contained with that large number of chestnuts. But if you only have a few stragglers, I would highly recommend putting in some substrate, potentially like peat moss that I have here. This peat moss, you want it to be a little bit wet, a little bit moist, but not so much that it's dripping. Go ahead, store your peat moss in the bag, your labeled bag. 
and store it for the next two to three months. Again, all of this information can be found on our fact sheets and also is available um, on our website and at, with your local regional science coordinator. So feel free to reach out with any questions and thank you so much for listening. So we'll stop here for a minute and take any questions. Um, so we do have one here in the chat. So just as a reminder, uh, please put questions in the Q&A just because it's easier for us to keep track of that. But I, I, Douglas, I did catch this one here before it got lost. Um, the question is, is there a good alternative to peat moss peat moss seems to not be a sustainable resource. So does anybody want to take that one? Uh, for larger lots of seeds, sometimes we just skip the peat moss altogether. Um, you will get a little bit more mold and you want to make sure you have enough nuts that they don't dry out quickly. You know, I wouldn't do it for like five, um, but you know, a couple hundred can work. The biggest thing is to make sure you have good sanitation beforehand. So the sooner you can go from collecting seeds off of a tree to getting them cleaned and into storage, the better. Because the longer they spend um, floating around collecting mold spores or anything else, the, the more likely they get kind of yucky. Um, and particularly if you harvest off the ground, there's a lot of a lot of things that, that tag along from ground harvest and nuts. Um, beyond that, we've had folks try sand, kitty litter, um, sphagnum moss. Um, I'm, we, we have not found an alternative to peat other than just not using any media that we've really glommed onto, but some of these other things have worked for folks. Um, so there's certainly things that you could try, but you're really looking for something that's going to keep them from drying out and also help to keep that mold growth at bay. That's all I got. I don't know that I'd recommend the kitty litter at all, though. I don't think that actually was very effective. Yeah, no, I would say it has been tried. <laughs> it has been tried. Yeah, the, the sand, the sand I would think works. it would desiccate them. I don't think it, yeah, probably not great. Sand, I think, was better. Yeah, Especially sand, damp sand, sand maybe. I think the peat, you know, and, and from the question of sustainability, I think the nice thing about peat is that you can then put it into the planting hole. So it's not only a good way to store it, but then you can reuse it and use it as, as part of an organic amendment. Um, for, for planting, which is often used. Um, does a fungicide help reduce that mold at all? Uh, I was gonna say, I think there's been hydrogen peroxide treatments that folks use, especially for nuts that they're gonna eat. Um, that's like a, a pre-storage tre pre treatment. Um, I usually give them a dilute bleach bath before I store them. Um, you know, that allows you to do a float test for viability and also you can give them a quick clean, but um, I don't think we've tried any fungicides on the nuts themselves. Uh, yeah, Jason, and on, oh, on that note, if there's something very general purpose, if someone wanted to try, yeah, whether a disinfectant or copper or something, that that would seem okay. But but with an actual fungicide with a synthetic product, I would make sure to follow the label um, and don't and don't do an off-label use of of any product like that. Thanks, Vasily. Keep us in line. Um, Jay mentions, uh, Jay says, mentioned to put the bag in a container to catch the grubs. So yeah, I don't think, uh, Jamie mentioned chestnut weevils, but, um, yeah, if you're, if your chestnuts are weevily, you will get an abundance of them at the bottom of your, your refrigerator or wherever you're storing them. Um, I actually, I've had them chew through plastic containers, thin plastic containers. Um, I don't know, Sierra, have you guys found any, any methods of keeping weevils contained or you just let them run wild we let them run wild and then we collect them and send them to uh <laughs> partner researchers <laughs> do you you send the weevils to a farm upstate is that <laughs> what you do um mark says i use fred heber's formula of a third peat a third vermiculite a third perlite three parts of the mixture to one part water mark so you, that's how you store them you store them that way, and then that's just part of the planting mix. I guess I'm looking for that for clarification on that one. Um, let's see. Alan uses fresh hardwood sawdust. I've seen people have good good success with that too. I think peat has better um, antimicrobial properties because uh, it's it's a little bit more acidic, um, so it might might help keep some of that mold at bay. I had someone else say try bleach. That that works too. I think I have one more question here. Yeah, someone's asked a few yes. times about coconut core. I've never tried that for seed storage. Um, if it, if someone tries it, let us know how it works. I see a uh, what fridge temp temp is recommended, and then how long are they uh, viable for? Fridge temp recommended thirty four to forty degrees or above freezing. 
and not too warm because you don't want the radicals to get too crazy before you plant them. How long yeah, are they ripe right for? I'm not sure the answer to that. Someone it's, else. it's about six months. I mean, every month that goes, so like you, you kind of want about a three month stratification time period. So if you collect them in September, October, by December, January, they're ready to plant in a greenhouse. Um, and then until about June, maybe even July, they're viable. You can keep them the next year. I have, but your viability drops significantly um, past that next year. Um, so, you know, if you have 90% or so viability of the seed in that first season, you're probably down to 5 10% um, a year later. And then you can't keep them past, past that. At least I, I don't know of any technique. Anybody else know of a technique to keep them past that time period? No, I mean, I've potted stuff that's, you know, been in the fridge two, three years with very long radicals and they'll generally sprout, but they're not very robust. You know, they don't, they don't have a lot of resources to get going. So, um, I'll take these last two here. When can I start planting saplings outside here in Pennsylvania? Uh, that's uh, really, so if they're fresh, if they're succulent and, and have full leaves, that's after your frost free date is, is what we recommend. So that's going to depend on where, where you are in PA, which is going to be different in York County versus, say, Forest County. All right. Well, I think most of these other ones we will we will catch in the next uh, segments. Um, how, who is next? Was that Sierra that's next? Uh, yep. Sierra is up next. Sierra, you yep. want to introduce your segment? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Sierra Wilbur. I'm the nursery manager over at the American Chestnut Foundation Meadowview Research Farms in Meadowview, Virginia. And this next video is going to be covering uh, sowing your stratified chestnuts in containers. And I'll do an introduction at the beginning of the video as well. Hi, my name is Sierra Wilbur. I'm the nursery manager here at Meadowview Research Farms. And today I'm gonna to be sharing with you how to plant your containerized chestnut seedlings. So the first thing you need to think about when you're going to plant containerized chestnuts is the type of pot you're going to use. And so I have an array of pots here going from small, medium to large. Firstly, we've got these small pots, they're called D40s, a lot of people do use these. But what you need to notice and the difference between these small pots and some of the other small pots that you might have seen is that they may be narrow, but they're really long. And that length is really important to accommodate the length of the chestnut root as it grows. Secondly, we've got these. These are pretty common sized pots that you might have gotten and might have laying around already that come from garden stores um, for plants that you might have already got. These are totally fine to use. However, a lot of other chestnut growers, including us, we like to use these. These are called CP413s or citrus pots. And the point of these is that, again, they have a rather narrow top. These are about four by four inches um, in diameter or you know width. But then in length, this is 13 and a half inches and 10 inches. Okay, and so again, that's to make sure that we have enough length, um, room for the roots to grow down and keep growing um, as they grow. Lastly, I've got this two gallon pot here. Again, it's longer than it is wide. You do not want to directly sow chestnut seeds into a pot like this. This pot should be used for transplanting some of your smaller um, seedlings in. Once they get between 6 and 12 inches tall, you can move this into a larger pot. But you don't want to sow seeds directly into a pot like this because the seedlings, um, they won't be drying down enough and it will stunt their growth because they're basically drowning. So um, in terms of sowing your seeds, go for the small to medium sizes and make sure that they have enough length for the roots. So the second most important thing that you need to think about when you are potting chestnut seedlings, containerized chestnut seedlings, is the type of potting media that you use. You're going to want to aim for something that is acidic and well draining. And so here in our nursery, we're using this potting soil and you can see that it is primarily processed pine bark, perlite, and other, and it's just generally well draining things. And you look here, the sphagnum moss content is only 25 to 35%. You wanna make sure that you don't exceed this amount for peat moss content because that will make the soil uh, too wet and we want well draining soil. So here we have a side-by-side -side of our bark-based, pine bark-based media and a common potting media that you would use 
for growing um, like vegetables for your garden or house plants and that kind of thing. If you look at these side by side, right, you can see the bark in this bark based media. Um, the particles are so much larger and that allows it to be um, more well draining. And then you can see, right, I just picked up a little bit more of the, the peat moss that's in there. But the majority of this mix is the perlite and the bark, the pine bark. Whereas this potting meat, you can just see how much finer all of those particles are. And you can imagine how much more um, water would be held in this. You can almost tell that there's more sphagnum moss in this bark, um, in this potting media. So we're going to want to go for something with larger particles. Um, pine bark based, low sphagnum moss, perlite, something that is well draining. So very quickly, but equally as important when you are growing containerized seedlings, it's really important that you have some kind of labeling system in place. Um, as much as we all think that we're just gonna remember, it's much safer if you create a label for each of the pots and you know what's in those pots. So here we have printed labels. Um, you can order printed labels. You can order, you know, just the, the slip itself and you can write on it. You can use tape on the pot. Whatever the DIY or whatever method you choose to use is fine. Just make sure that you're labeling your pots. So now that you have filled your container with potting media, uh, you have your tags, you are ready to sow your seeds. And so your seeds are coming um, probably from the refrigerator, right? Because they were stratified. Um, and I like to create some holes preemptively, doesn't matter when you do this, but I like to make them um, up to an inch deep, but just to make some little holes to prep for the seeds going in. All right, and so here is an example of a chestnut seed, right? So it's got that flat bottom and a rounded top. And this is an example of one that has a very small radical coming out. You might have some that don't have radicals coming out. And in that case, what you're gonna wanna do is plant the flat side down rounded top up. So just go ahead and plop that right in the pot, cover it up with soil, give it a nice little pat, and you're good. Um, seeds that have radicals coming out, you do want to be a little bit more delicate because this radical is um, their first root. It's not the end of the world if you break it, but just be aware that they are sensitive. Okay, so here's some examples of some seeds with radicals, okay? And as you can see, like this one is going sideways, this one's kind of going down, this one is going up. Um, so you do kind of want to follow the lead of the radical in this case, you can point this one down. So we'll go ahead, even though the it's going up towards the rounded top, you can put that one in um, upside down. Just place that in there, cover it on up. Take this one, this one's pretty, um, pretty whatever right? The radicals just growing however it wants. This one you can just plant like normal. Just try not to break it. It's fine if you do. Um, but that radical will, will find its way down, right? Plants are pretty smart. All right. So that is uh, sowing the seeds. So after you have sown all of your seeds in the pots, it's time to water them in. So uh, it's important to water them to saturation on your first go. All right, and so if you're using a hose, that's going to take a lot longer than you expect it to. Okay, and so if you're using, like, again, a regular hose, um, you're going to see them, like, fill up over time, but it will take multiple passovers for all of the soil to actually get moist and saturated all the way through. You could actually wet the soil before you sow the seeds if you don't have right like an overhead irrigation system which is what we have here um, in terms of if you have an irrigation system you'll be able to turn it on and walk away and when you come back and the pots are dripping out of the bottom then you'll know that they're saturated you'll be able to pick it up it'll be really heavy you'll see it coming through the bottom like the water is coming through the bottom um, but when it comes to using a hose you might have to pass through and then pass through again, it's going to take much longer than you think it does. Because even at first, when you're watering, um, if the so if the potting media, if the bark isn't saturated already, it's going to create channels through the bark, and it's going to look like it's dripping out of the bottom anyways. It is not saturated at that point. You will know when it's saturated. It will be heavy. It will be. It will feel much cooler inside of the pot, and um, every it, you'll you'll know, you'll know. So just don't. Uh, don't underwater on the first try. We are watering to saturation. So no matter how long it takes, 
Um, it might take a whole day to get it done, but you can do it water desaturation on the first try. Okay, awesome. So you sown your seeds, you watered them in, and then you left them alone because you don't want to water them uh, after your first initial watering for quite some time. And now they're germinating, okay? It's going to take most seeds an average of 7 to 14 days, right? One to two weeks to start germinating. Some of them can take longer, up to 21 plus days, um, but the vast majority are going to take 7 to 14. And so I've got a little example here of what they look like when they're first popping out of the ground. Okay, a little bit taller. And now you've got a real seedling, you're off and running. So important thing to think about in terms of your seedlings and germination is making sure that they have enough sun, right? So we're here in a greenhouse, obviously we get all the sunlight. When we start these seedlings in late winter, um, we have, you know, an additional number of months um, and the sun is continuing to get higher and higher. And so that is allowing the seedlings to get more and more sun. For you, if you're doing this inside of your house, you might start in like a west or east facing window and then transition them into a south facing full sun area. What you're going to want to completely avoid is any north facing windows, anything that does not have direct sunlight. Um, the sun is really important. That's what the trees are eating, right? That's important for you to have um, enough sunlight for these guys. All right, so now you have germinated seeds in pots. It's important that you do a number of things in terms of maintaining them and keeping them alive for the rest of the growing season until you're gonna plant them. All right, and so probably the number one most important thing or equally important thing is fertilizing, all right? So one thing you can do in terms of adding um, some food, plant food, fertilizer into your pots is a long, slow release fertilizer um, like this. You can mix that into the potting media so that the seedlings already have something to get them going when they're sown. And it'll give them just a little bit of extra food throughout the growing season. But as soon as you get them germinated and they look like they're doing all right, um, you're going to want to give them some slow release fertilizer. Okay, and so slow release fertilizer, you can do um, something that is made for evergreen or azaleas blueberries. An acid-loving plant fertilizer is going to be really um, ideal for chestnuts, all right? And so what you're going to, how, how often, is going to depend on the size of the pot and the instructions on the bag. Bags of fertilizer usually have um, recommendations based on the size of your pot. It'll tell you how much and how often you need to apply it. Um, so for this one, we usually end up doing it every two months. If you have access, what you can also do is use a water soluble fertilizer. And so this goes directly into, it's injected into the, the irrigation system and that's what you call fertigation. And so you are injecting a fertilizer directly into the water system and that's going directly into the pots. And so when we use the water soluble fertilizer, we're using drip irrigation directly into the pots. There are also options um, like where you attach it to the head, like um, head of a hose, and that's another way you can do fertigation, um, do it yourself method. So make sure that you are creating some kind of fertilizer regime for your chestnuts throughout the whole growing season. Equally as important as fertilization is your watering regime, right? And so when we first uh, sowed the seeds, we said you want to water to saturation. And I just want y'all to be aware that even though you're watering to saturation at the beginning, that is the, that is the type of watering you want to do. It's going to be dry down and then watering, a deep watering. Okay. So it's going to be deep watering, dry down, deep watering and dry down. Okay. And so you can check that by using the finger method, testing the inside of the pot, but that's not always going to be the best judge because these pots are so long. Right. And so what you're going to want to do is feel the pot. You'll know if there's a lot of moisture at the bottom, you don't want to water yet. If it gets to a point where it's getting pretty light, it's getting warm, and maybe there's just a little bit of coolness and moisture in the middle, that's a good time to water, okay? And so after you water to saturation, when you sow the seeds, you may be waiting a month or more to do your next watering. Um, it depends on how much sunlight they're getting, how fast they're growing, right? That is what is going to depend on how often you water. Um, again, the small D40, the small skinny tubes are going to dry down much faster than these taller pots. And so that's another thing to keep in mind. So really, you're going to need to just get into the feel of what the plants need, 
how the water is inside of the pot and it just takes practice. Um, but just make sure that you are watering deeply and then drying down fully before you water again. And most importantly, have fun, enjoy growing chestnuts, make your own little experiments, but these are some really great ways that you can uh, grow your containerized seedlings and generally have success. Thanks, you to Europe. Um, we have lots of questions here. Um, I want to take this one. This is actually, um, Sierra, this might be a good one for you to, to take too. Uh, not exactly about containerized specifically, but, but I think this is what a lot of people see. Some of my trees after emerging stop growing and then grow a new stem from the original. What causes this? To be honest that I don't know exactly what causes it so Sarah maybe you can uh like fill in that but I do know that the the root the seed right it has it's a thick seed so it has enough energy in there and so if it's not successful on the first go it's going to shoot up another shoot and it's going to just keep going and so we have a number of seedlings that end up having a couple of shoots um it's not abnormal um as long as it keeps growing that's good Sarah do you know why the first shoot doesn't succeed and not not always. Sometimes it's something called damping off and it could be a fungal issue and then it'll just send up a new one, like you said, like just in response to that. Um, sometimes I think it's a um, I can't prove this. I'd, I'd love for someone to really take this and run with it. But uh, I've I've observed that chestnuts that get frozen and don't die sometimes do that and they'll send up like these measly little shoots so like that initial um sprout will come up and then die back and they'll send up these nasty looking things and sometimes it can recover like you can you can cut that off and then get a nice shoot coming up from it again but i feel like that freezing sometimes creates some genetic deformations that that prompts it to do that i don't know kendra cassie vasily y'all notice anything like that I've seen similar stuff and I usually just assume that it was mad about something. <laughs> Not to anthropomorphize our chestnuts, but like obviously something wasn't going right the first time. So they just, they were right. trying again. Um, and I usually let them go. And, you know, it once you have, if you have a few like stems that all like look decent and have some leaves, like it doesn't hurt to to thin those down to, to one at that point. But um, I wait and see which one wins. Um. Sierra, I'm glad that you mentioned watering. Um, Greg Miller, who grow, who has grown, I don't know, probably millions of chestnuts at this point, says that there's two ways to kill chestnuts, and that's overwatering and underwatering. Um, so there's definitely a balance to be to be struck there. Um, uh, Alan asks, can you provide a list of commercially available potting mixes suitable for chestnuts? I don't know that we have that. We don't have that. And uh, I mean, we don't get any like affiliate marketing <laughs> from telling you, but we could, uh, we could theoretically, I can tell you specifically the ones that we use here that we've shared with a number of our chapters are the ProMix BK55 potting media. And that's the bark based potting media that we use. I know someone asked about that. And then the slow release fertilizer um, that was shown that was for acid loving plants, that's Hollytone. Um, and that's pretty much what we use. And a lot of people have success with Osmocote slow release fertilizers as well. Well, and yeah. someone else mentioned too, like the, the standard meth, um, media for chestnut has long been a third each peat perlite and vermiculite, and you mix that together. Um, I've been using the BK55 also in the greenhouse. Um, and I think we, we've used Scott's moisture control or, or similar generic versions of that. Um, in some cases, it's at least readily available for folks that don't have access to, you know, be able to order from a greenhouse supply. But I don't know how many of these like products we should really name dropping. So <laughs> not specifically endorsed by the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, <laughs> but I think I think, Sierra, you hit it. You know, it really needs to be a very light mix that dries out quickly. Um, chestnuts don't like wet feet. Um, uh, Carol says, I recently potted up my chestnuts and they have begun to germinate, but I realize my potting medium is too dense. Will it be best to carefully repot now using a more bark based medium? I don't want to damage them, but uh, maybe best to fix now. What do, you, what do you think about that, Sierra? Yeah, as long as they're not at that like early stage of germination, give them like three inches and so that they have like a few sets of true leaves, at least one set of true leaves. Um, yeah, go for it. Get something that's a little bit uh, lighter and more airy. 
Um, Kendra, I'm going to pitch this one to you. I have a few seedlings planted that have lots of branching. Should any of these be clipped off? If so, should I wait until the seedlings leaf? Still butts, but showing, oh, still buds, but showing signs of opening. Uh, that might be more about branching. Is that about pruning? That's from an anonymous attendee too. I'm not sure exactly who wrote that, but um, I, I think you were referring more to stuff coming up from, from the base. Yeah, so when there's multiple shoots, I usually let those go for a bit and then pick one um, so that you have a single stem. Um, I don't know that I'd be cutting off anything otherwise until you have like you know quite a few true leaves and can see what the form is going to be like I mean those leaves are food production so I wouldn't I wouldn't be aggressive with that when they're really little I guess um thanks Kendra Sierra if if Stanley wants to plan growing his trees in an indoor greenhouse do you have an acceptable humidity range our humidity ranges, um, like during this time of the year, it's a little lower, like 50%, but in the summer, humidity gets pretty high. I just try and mimic outdoor humidity, like 70% is pretty um, acceptable if you were going to mimic it. Have you noticed any difference in germination time between chestnut species? The, yeah, the Chinese chestnuts do great and they shoot up very quickly and they grow very, very well. And other than that, it does kind of depend on what the crosses are. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that we like to research and look into and compare. Well, and that's generally because the nut's bigger, right, on that Chinese. And I mean, I think the Europeans do typically, because they tend to be larger too, they tend to sprout more quickly as well. Yeah, and we haven't grown many European chestnuts here. Um, but yeah, definitely the size of the nut is going to be a, a helpful indicator of how fast it's going to grow and how big it's going to get early on. Uh, Deborah asks, are some chestnuts more tolerant of non-acidic conditions than others? Anyone else want to take that? <laughs> Kendra looks like she's unmuting. I, I don't know. Um, I've always been under the impression that Chinese chestnut has slightly different site requirements from, from American chestnut. I don't know exactly what makes a Chinese chestnut happy. They tend to do fine where we plant American chestnuts. Um, you know, we usually use them as controls, but I actually am not sure if they have that same acid loving requirement that American chestnut does. I think they can handle more more basic conditions. There's still a limit though, but I think American chestnuts can handle the more acidic conditions and the Chinese chestnuts can handle the the less like, a, you know, maybe a 6.5 to, I don't know if they'll do well up to seven, but I think they do better at like 6.5, 6.7 than American chestnuts do. Yeah, I know we have an orchard in, in Rhode Island with some pH issues. You know, the pH has been higher than than preferred and the, the thriving trees are F1s in Chinese. And... Yeah, and, and Tim ec echoes that. He says Chinese are tolerant of a higher pH. That's that's my experience. All right, I'll take one more here, which is uh, from Jeremy. Is there an instance of multiple embryos in C. dentata? Yes, there are <laughs> twins. I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen more than two. Have you guys seen any more than two? Vasily, you have? I think uh, Max was like five. In one seed, year. really? Yeah, it was it was a particular cross, and it had lots of lots and lots of multiples, like up to five. I think that's fascinating. Very cool. All right. Um. Well, let's move on. Hal, who's next? Next up is Kendra. All right, Kendra, you want to introduce your clip? I'm Kendra Collins. I'm the science coordinator for New England, and also the director of regional programs, based up here in Burlington, Vermont. And I'm pretty sure I say all those things in my video, also. So. Um, so you're going to learn about how to direct seed chestnuts, which is one of my favorite ways of planting trees in the field. All right. Thanks, Kendra. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kendra Collins. I'm the director of regional programs for TACF, as well as the science coordinator for New England. And I get to show you guys today how to direct seed chestnuts. Um, direct seeding is one of the many planting tools in our toolbox, and there are a couple reasons why you might direct seed. It's actually one of my favorite methods, in part because it's very low input. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, some people really like planting seedlings because then you know at least you're starting with a tree, 
or they might be like planting potted seedlings so they at least know that the nut is going to germinate and there's great reasons to do both of those uh, methods. Direct seeding, we typically get about 80 to 90% germination as long as the nuts have been stored well. So it's still a really effective way of planting and it's especially great if you're planting in a location that maybe doesn't have great access to water. If you're planting seedlings, uh, there's a little bit more aftercare involved. When you're direct seeding, your chestnut is going in the ground it's going to, you know, grow a root right where that root is going to stay for the rest of its life. You don't have to disturb the, the chestnut tree at any point. Um, and that makes it a little easier to get them established. Another reason you might want to direct seed is um, if you're planting an awful lot of material. <laughs> direct seeding is, you know, there's not a lot of cost involved with preparing seedlings ahead of time. All you need are the nuts. Um, they're relatively easy to get to a site. They're relatively easy for people to bring out and around. Um, they're quick to plant. Um, and then again, whatever your aftercare opportunities may be, if there's not a lot of great access to water, direct seeding can be um, a nice option because at least you don't have that transplant shock to, to work through. Um, so let me just dive right into how we actually do this. So essentially you're taking a chestnut seed and putting it in the ground. I'll show you a chestnut seed here. So these are seeds that have been overwintering in my refrigerator. They're actually, they were collected from this orchard and um, they've all sprouted. You can see they all have a nice long radical that's trying to grow down. And one of the things we wanna take into consideration with direct seeding is that chestnut does produce this long radical and eventually will wanna produce a taproot. And so it's really nice if you can loosen up the soil ahead of time in some fashion. Um, if you're planting into sod, if you can plow ahead of time, or I really like a soil auger, even like a little one that you might use for bulb planting, but just something that's gonna loosen up the soil and give this radical um, kind of a, a super highway to just grow straight down into the ground to find that deeper, those deeper sources of water and get that root system established quickly. Um, another thing that we do um, often with direct seeding is provide a weed-free germinating environment. You know, we're planting right into the native soil. Hopefully you've done a good job with your site selection. The native soil is, is good for chestnut. Um, but there's likely some weed seeds in there, particularly if you're planting into a situation like where I am, where, where this is turf, this is grass. There's a lot of other, you know, weedy species around that produce seeds and might be trying to grow in this nicely prepared hole that we have. So, um, you can use a variety of things for your weed-free germinating mix. Really, whatever you might use to pot a chestnut seedling should work fine. So, you know, the magic mix is a third each peat, perlite, and vermiculite, or there's a couple commercial blends that we like. I grabbed what I had in the greenhouse um, that I use for chestnut potting. And um, the other thing that we add to this often, especially, again, if you're planting in a field site, is a little bit of forest soil to try and inoculate the soil with some beneficial mycorrhizae that are more associated with tree species. Uh, those those species tend those mycorrhizal species tend to be missing in a site that's been a field for a long time. So you don't need a lot of this germinating mix, really. Just you know, this was about half of a, a yogurt container, kind of maybe you know a generous couple of handfuls, um, and then you just make a little hole down in. And I'll probably make a second take of this video so that you can actually see what I'm doing here. But you make a little hole. You want your um, radical to grow down. Um, so if the nut isn't sprouted, typically you want to point the, the pointy end sideways so that it has the opportunity to grow down. Um, but if the, the radical is already out, you just want to kind of move that nut in whatever orientation has the root point, pointing down. So make a little hole with your finger, plant that um, not too deep. Um, no more than a you know half inch, maybe an inch. I like to be able to actually just see the top of the nutshell. Um, chestnuts are prone to molding, so if you um, and then rotting. So if you plant them too deep and they stay really wet, especially with a lot of spring rain, they may rot before they sprout. So if you can see the top of the nut, at least you know it's not really buried like a like a crocus bulb or something. That's not the not what we're going for. So you get that that nut in the ground. Um, you're planting a food source for many, many creatures. So we like to protect our chestnut seedlings with 
a shelter of some sort. This is a plastic vented shelter um, that we're having that we're using in this particular orchard. There's a variety of things you could use. We could probably spend a whole chestnut chat talking about shelter types. Um, but you want to sink that in a couple inches into the ground if you can. This site is really sandy, so I could probably sink this about halfway. <laughs> Not every site is that accommodating. Um, but you want to sink this down in, and then if you look down into the shelter, you'll actually see the nut pops up a little bit from the soil being pushed down around it. And so that's where it's good to have some people with skinny arms <laughs> to just kind of loosely tamp that back down with your the back of your knuckles and then install your stake, tighten up the zip ties on the shelter, and you're essentially good. Um, this site already has weed fabric down to handle vegetation competition. Again, there's many ways to handle vegetation competition. Um, you know, landscape fabric down the whole row, weed mats around an individual planting site, or if um, if you prefer, um, herbicide works just as well. You really just don't want to have competition for your new little chestnut tree. So um, I think beyond that, um, it's always good after a, a planting to just find out, finish it off with a little drink. Um, you schedule your planting around some spring rain. You might just get some help with, with that from Mother Nature, but I think that's about it for direct seeding. Thanks. Kendra. I don't know that we have too many questions from that. Uh, a lot of questions about tree shelters. Francis Toller says, I bought five foot tree shelters because of deer pressure on my seed planting site near Shenandoah Park. You're using much shorter shelters. Will these be okay? The planter ones. Um, I prefer short shelters and our general preference is for short shelters and to use something else for deer protection, like a, a cage or something. Um, that's, you know, farther away from the tree. Uh, what happens with those tall shelters, chestnut is really good at reaching for the light. And so when you plant in a tall shelter, they tend to shoot up and you have a lot of vegetative growth that is pushing that tree, that seedling up and out of the shelter as quickly as possible. And then they're kind of floppy. I don't know if that's really a good tree term, but they don't develop the structural strength, like sort of the reactionary wood that they would if they were up and out of the shelter quickly and being um, impacted by, you know, natural wind on the site and things like that. So we tend to recommend against those tall shelters. You can always cut them in half. Um, that's always often something I've done when I've had tall shelters um, donated. Um, <laughs> flop top. Thanks, Jay. Um, but yeah, a shorter shelter that the tree can get up and out of quickly, but it's still going to protect the base against smaller critters coupled with a, a um, cage that you can make out of like garden wire or something is, is usually what we would recommend over using a, a tall shelter on its own. Because deer do love chestnuts. I think Sarah has often described them as Kit Kats. I think you could insert your favorite candy bar um, reference in there. But once they get a taste for them, they will continue to come back and you can end up with chestnut shrubs, which is not not ideal. Um, yeah, I, I I tended to call that. Uh, so Jay calls it top flop or flop top. I call it tree flop. Um, it, it it I think it's it may not be the best term, but it's certainly appropriate. Um, and I'll add to you know if you have no other choice, if you can't do a cage and you can't do a fence, then the five foot tree shelters are okay. But um, if you can avoid it, um, that tends to be best for chestnuts, especially in more colder climates down south. I think they do a little bit better in those taller tree shelters, but especially up north, you get a, a, a lot of issues with dieback and, and tree flop. Um, a lot of questions about timing for, for direct seeding outside. Can you speak to that, Kendra? Um, you know, often the recommendation is pea planting time, you know, kind of like what, whenever the ground can be worked. Personally, I tend to go a little bit past that um, because again, you're, you're burying food. So you want to kind of hit that sweet spot of planting when it's warm enough that the seeds are actually going to germinate fairly quickly. Um, because the other risk factor is that if the soil is cold and wet for a long time, the seeds may rot before they sprout. Um, but you can definitely get away with planting them, you know, a couple weeks before your frost free date. You know, I, I would say it typically takes two to three weeks for the seeds to germinate and, and sprout. So, if you can kind of work backwards from when it should be warm enough to have leaves out, 
um, that usually is going to be um, a good time for that. You can plant later. I've planted with direct seeded with school groups as late as late June, which I was a little worried about, but the trees did okay. So it's not, you know, you're not going to hurt anything if you don't plant um, before your frost free date, but you can certainly get things out a little earlier than you could with like a containerized seedling. Well, I think, Kendra, you can you can actually plant the seeds out before a frost free date. I mean, we've planted in early March here in central PA. And I think what happens is they just they hang out they and, do. and wait until they need to germinate. You know, they kind of know what's going on. I mean, you don't want them to freeze in the ground long term. So it's it's more about when when is the ground going to not be completely frozen um, yeah. and freeze hard to, to kill that seed is the main the main thing. Yeah. I always worry about them getting eaten before they sprout or molt or rotting, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have definitely planted in April up here in um, in northern New England without too much issue. Um, a lot of questions about shelters. Do you want to say anything about brands, venting, size, anything more about that? I mean, there's, there's a lot of options out there. We tend to use Tree Pro and Plantra, I think, the most often, um, but I think, you know, more of a solid sided shelter with vent holes is probably going to be better. There are some of those like mesh ones. Um, I don't tend to like those or, or homemade ones with like hardware cloth. You get the um, branches growing through those um, and they can be really hard to get back out. So um, those can be a little bit more troublesome. I think as long as it's something that you can get your arm down inside of, you're going to get a lot of vegetation growing inside the shelter. So something that's wide enough that you can get your arm in and yank the grass out or whatever else is coming up in there um, is going to be helpful. Um, I've had folks get really excited about making that out of like hardware cloth. And those are just so rough on your knuckles. <laughs> you go to weed them and it's like, why would I do that? I don't want to put my hand in there. So, you know, don't make things worse for yourself. You're going to have to take care of these trees. Um, but the vented shelters are nice, or at least they make me feel better that like they're not going to, you know, the heat level doesn't build up as much. I don't, if you're using herbicide, I think there's still enough of a shield that you don't have to worry too much about herbicide drift through those teeny little holes. But um, yeah, we've had folks use Blue X. I mean, there's a lot of options out there. So yeah, um, Blue X, Plantra, Tree Pro, Tubex oh yeah, I are four Tubex. of the four of the primary um, brands. Um, but I think you can you can kind of ask everybody on this screen what their favorite one you might get a different answer <laughs> depending on who you ask so you know kind of uh, your mileage may vary um is there a, so a couple questions here about spacing you want to address that kendra what what are the questions about spacing just what, like what, how what close spacing? or how far yeah, how away? close how far apart yeah yeah you know, it kind of depends on like how big you want you're expecting the trees to get and and you know what your your um purpose is um, you can plant chestnuts pretty close together. I mean, in our seed orchards, which we intend, you know, the intention is to thin them, they're on one foot spacing, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that um, unless you have a good reason. Um, typical orchard spacing is, you know, somewhere between seven and eight feet between trees, 10, you know, 15 feet or so between rows, 15 or 20. You know, I think 10 by 10 is kind of roughly the minimum we would recommend. 20 by 20 will give them a little bit more breathing room. Um, you know, I think even up to 40 by 40 for like production orchards. So, um, it's, it's a little all over the place. Um, but you, they hopefully will get big at some point. So giving them a little, like enough space. Um, and if you want to be able to, if pollination or, or working with the crown of the tree is something that you're interested in, giving them a little more space to make that accessible for yourself is definitely helpful. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the next section. There is so much good chat going on here. Lots of great questions and answers on how we're going to have to figure out how to organize all this stuff to, to get it out to the to the people after um, including the recording. Who's next, Hal? Next up is Vasily. All right, Vasily, you want to say a little bit about your clip? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Vasily Lakoba. I'm director of research with TACF. I'm located here at Metaview Research Farms in Metaview, Virginia. Uh, and the segment that I'm going to be um, presenting is on transplanting containerized seedlings into an orchard setting into the ground. And, uh, you know, uh, my apologies ahead of time for the amount of wind we had outside that day, but I think Hal put in some captions, so you should be all good. Hi. 
My name is Vasily Lakoba. I am Director of Research with the American Chestnut Foundation here at Meadowview Research Farms. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the next step in planting American chestnuts, which is selecting a site, selecting seedlings, looking at your soil to make sure it's good, and actually planting the trees in the ground so that they can grow for many years. So the first thing that you're going to want to consider as you're planning on planting chestnut trees out in the field is selecting ones from your nursery that are actually appropriate to plant out at this particular time. So I have seedlings uh, next to me right here. I have three of them and the three of them are different to illustrate a couple points. Now, the first one that you can see right here in front of my hand uh, is dormant, so there's not leaves uh, that are leafed out on it. And you'll notice that it's quite small. Now, because there's not a whole lot of growth above the ground, there's also not a lot of growth below ground in this case. And you want a seedling that's robust enough that it can survive the stresses of being transplanted out into the field. So if you have a seedling like this, pretty much regardless of the time of year, uh, you would be uh, wise to keep this one around in the nursery for a little bit longer where it can grow up a little more and then maybe you want to plant it at a later date. Now farther over on this side, you can see we have a seedling that's in a two gallon pot, one of those very large pots. The seedling is large, it likely has quite a good amount of root mass as well below ground, quite robust. You'll notice though, the different thing about this one is that its leaves are out. Now that's great, but right now, as we're filming, it's the end of March in Southwest Virginia, and it is a ways away from our last frost date. So it would not be wise to plant this seedling that's gotten used to uh, greenhouse conditions for this season already, out into the cold and potentially some freezes coming up. So for today's planting, we're gonna select this seedling that's in the middle right here. Now this one's dormant, just like the first one I showed you, but you'll notice it's quite a bit taller. And so this seedling is least vulnerable to the stresses of transplanting because of its size and because of its dormancy. So as we go here from the nursery out into the field, this is the seedling that we're gonna take with us. Now, chestnuts tend to be specialist plants, which means that they can't just grow anywhere and be happy. They need very particular conditions in order to establish a crop. This site is not good for chestnuts because it is a little bit lower elevation and it does get a little wetter than especially those young trees are able to tolerate. Just like in the nursery where you want to create well-drained, and acidic conditions for those plants to thrive, you're gonna to want to look at the same thing out in the field. Now, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to consider when you're planting chestnut seedlings out in the field is making sure that the good site that you've selected has soil that's prepared to accept those seedlings as you plant them. That means you're gonna to want to loosen up the soil. Where I'm standing here, if I take this sharpshooter shovel and I put it down where the soil has not been uh, loosened at all, you can tell that I can stand on that shovel without it really going into the ground much. Now, if I put that same shovel over here where the soil has been loosened, it goes in pretty easily, like so. So the soil there is loose and it's good for planting, whereas where I'm standing, it's not good. So make sure that you prepare your soil. The next thing that you're going to want to consider as you're planning on planting chestnut seedlings out into an orchard is the spacing. So I'm standing in the middle of a planting where the trees within the row are spaced at five feet apart. This spacing was selected for a very specific reason because this is an experimental planting that is only meant to be in the ground in this form for a couple seasons. Because this is a very short term planting, that is okay for these purposes as they're not going to get very tall and start crowding each other, so it's all good. Now, if you are planting chestnuts to grow for a much longer amount of time, you're going to want to space them farther apart and that's all going to depend on how large you're expecting them to get based on what species they are, as well as how long you intend for them to be in your planting. At this point, you've gone into the loosened soil and you can see you've also prepared 
a hole for your seedling to be planted in. Now notice that the depth of the pot is similar to the depth of the hole. That's roughly how you want to dig so that it accommodates the full depth. You certainly don't want it to be too shallow and trying to jam roots into a shallow hole. You don't want that. You want this hole to be at least twice the width of the pot. The same depth, but twice the width. The reason for that is when we put the soil back in a moment here, it's going to be loose soil and it's going to be easier for the roots to grow in as opposed to a very constricted, uh, very packed cylinder into which the roots may not be able to penetrate. What I'm going to do now is take the seedling out of the pot and I'm going to remove as much of the soil as I can, or rather the potting media, from the roots. Now this is not a practice that's always done. In some cases it may be more or less appropriate, but for today's planting we are going to remove the potting media so that you can have immediate contact between the roots of this seedling and the soil in the ground. As I'm removing this soil or this media, I'm going to make sure it's not going into the planting hole. There we go. Doesn't need to be perfect, but it's pretty good. So here are my roots. You can see they're nice and robust. This is one of the reasons we selected this seedling for planting. I'm going to interlace my fingers with those roots so that they're not all clumped together when I fill the soil back in. As I'm going to hold it, I'm going to make sure that the level of where the potting media was is the same as where my soil line is going to be so that my seedling is not too deep, buried too deep, and so it's not too high with roots exposed. At this point, the seedlings in the ground, the level of where the potting media was matches where the soil line now is. Now, it's important that most of the soil stays quite loose. However, just at the top, to make sure that we're at the right level and that it's not going to move vertically too much in the near future, I'm going to stomp around the base of the tree just a little bit. At this point, our seedlings planted. You're going to want to make sure that animals like deer and rodents don't eat them in their entirety, thus killing them. And you're also going to want to make sure that some of the competing vegetation around the chestnuts is not going to smother them before they're able to really take off and grow. This tree right here, which is not enclosed in a larger deer fence, needs protection from deer, so it's inside of a metal cage. This cage, in this context, is enough to deter deer from browsing it as opposed to other vegetation. Now, if you look down below, there is a plastic-based weed mat around the base of the tree, roughly two feet by two feet, and that also works to smother some of the weedy growth that could otherwise be competing with this tree. These seedlings are within a much larger deer fence that's nine feet tall, and so immediately around these plants, there is no kind of individual protection. There's no cages, there are no plastic tree tubes, they're just out here in the open within the fence. If you look down the row in which they're placed, you'll notice that there's also a strip of bare soil about a foot or two wide. In this case too, there's no weed mat because there is a carefully timed herbicide use program, uh, usually during the dormant season of these trees, that keep the competing vegetation away. So if that's an option that's accessible to you and something you might consider, and again, consult a professional in that field and read pesticide labels very carefully when attempting to design an herbicide program for keeping uh, weedy vegetation away from your chestnut trees. With that, I hope you enjoy the and enjoy planting chestnut trees. All right, it was windy that day, Vasily. Um, I had a couple questions, or there was a question that showed up in the chat um, about, uh, so Leslie says, during this video, the wind seems to be strong. Does a high wind area adversely affect the chestnuts, such as closing the leaves stomatas? 
Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so certainly things like wind and and other, you know, air quality issues, uh, they interact with stomata, but for the purposes of kind of getting the broad strokes right of a planting, I would not worry about things like stomatal activity. Uh, you know, chestnuts, they do well in, you know, mountain top habitats and things like that, very exposed areas as necessary. Um, you know, for a planting in particular, um, like if you if you had a uh, trees with kind of like young succulent leaves and things like that, that wind could be pulling off more moisture. But the way to counteract that is not to pick a different site. It's just to, first of all, use dormant seedlings um, and then just maybe maybe keep an eye on the weather a little bit. Uh, but no, I, I would I would not uh, make a site selection based on on wind patterns necessarily. Yeah, I think in some areas like in the Midwest, though, there it might be advisable to plant the trees near a windrow or something like that, because there are some pretty strong. I think like in, in southwestern Virginia or in most pieces, places in the east coast, you don't have strong winds like consistently, like daily. Um, but I have seen some issues with with wind and reducing overall growth uh, in, in areas like the Midwest um, and especially in the more northern areas where you have sort of the combination of wind and cold. Any anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly there, there could be measures to, to kind of protect the trees a little bit, but that's really something that's going to be a, a kind of case by case uh, basis. OK, a lot of questions like four or five. Why in the world? And that's an editorial. Did you um, remove the soil from around the tree, that containerized tree, before you planted it? Yeah, for sure. So, so in some cases you would do that, in other cases you would not. So, um, you know, one I think one of the questions brought up the fact that it can be a transition for the roots from you know being containerized to being out in the ground. Now that depends on how smooth of the transition that is. So, for example, if if you have a soil. Um, and, and it's been loosened up to a, or a, a soil texture, first of all, that's loose enough to begin with. And then maybe you've loosened up some more that the transition from the potting media to the soil um, is going to be fairly gradual, then that's perfectly fine. Um, maybe leave the media on there and kind of let it let it proliferate on its own uh, and, and penetrate with its roots through the, the kind of the native soil there. However, if you have an environment where you do have a clayier soil, a heavier soil, and even if you've, um, you know, uh, subsoiled on a on a on a good day where essentially you haven't created created sort of a glazed pot in a sense, um, even if you do have that heavier soil, it's not going to be a smooth transition from the media to the surrounding soil. And so you don't want your roots to again not to anth anthropomorphize them, but to make the decision to just stick in that cushy little little pot that you've created instead of you know a little pot you know out by itself now you've got it in a pot in the earth which is no better and so if they get pot bound there they're not going to be growing at all it's it's the same principle for why and I, I see somebody ask a question about them getting pot bound in a d40 for example it's the same reason you don't want them to be pot bound in a pot either you don't want them to be pot bound in a ground in the ground even when you buy for example larger trees that are ball and burlap it's the reason once you take off the burlap, why you rough up the of the roots so that they can make contact with that soil, which is very important. One of the things, again, when it's done correctly, that that can help with too is giving the trees kind of a head start on growth and reducing that transplant shock. But again, it'll it'll kind of vary site to site. Yeah, I've heard that when you get that glazing of the the uh, sides of a planting hole, I've called that the bathtub effect. Um, where you can get, and, and I've had a lot of seedlings, if you don't rough up and, and remove that, um, if you don't remove the soil from around the root ball and rough up the size of the pot, um, I've had a lot of issues with uh, frost heave, just, I mean, like almost literally um, throwing that, that whole seedling out of the ground, uh, depending on the soil type that it gets planted in. Um, Meg asks, in the upper Midwest or Wisconsin, if we seed directly as Kendra showed, will they get established enough to live through our harsh winters? I tried potting last year to transplant the next spring, but lost the seedling over winter. Uh, Meg, I will follow up here at the end with overwintering seedlings. Maybe we can address that. But but Kendra, I mean, you're in the great white north. I mean, direct seeding seems to work for you. Yeah. I mean, I think we generally assume chestnuts hardy to about zone four. Um, we've planted them well up into northern New England. Um, 
snowpack over them in the winter actually can help um, insulate them. They are certainly prone to shoot damage and winter injury um, in colder locations, particularly as juvenile trees. They seem to kind of outgrow that, or at least it's a smaller proportion of the tree. So they, you know, it doesn't bother them as much over time. Um, but I would think that that area would be okay for chestnut. If you're having trouble establishing them, there may be other site issues um, aside from just the temperature that maybe aren't as um, friendly to chestnut. Um, Basilia, I have a couple more questions for you. Uh, after you plant the seedlings, do you need to water them? Yeah, good, good question. So um, again, it depends on what the weather is doing. Um, so if you are able to time um, things so that nature does it for you, that's that's a good idea. But of course, especially if you're uh, not planting all that many, it may be entirely feasible for you to just bring out a bucket and and, and water them. So that can be a good idea. Uh, one of the reasons that can be a good idea, apart from obviously, you know, plants liking uh, to be watered sometimes, is if when you plant, again, um, if you have air pockets uh, around the roots, you'll want to eliminate those. And so one of the ways, of course, is tamping down the soil a little bit. But the other way to do that is letting the water do that kind of uh, by filtration uh, by itself. So it may be a good idea. But again, just as with the nursery instructions, don't overwater them. Don't don't kind of put them in a tub of water. All right, let's let's do one more and then we'll move on to, to Cassie and John. Um, a couple questions about transplant. How do you know when it's time to transplant? Can you trans transplant seedlings from one place to another? Any any advice there? Yeah, I mean, knowing when it's time to do it, you know, that's kind of uh, what we addressed in the in the beginning of the video. So it it does work uh, generally more safely if they're dormant, um, and it does work if they have a decent amount of root and shoot mass. Um, there's not, you know, a hard and fast rule, but if you want uh, to aim for a target, if the seedling is at least uh, about two feet tall, um, that that's you should be in the clear, um, at least for a fall planting. Um, in terms of uh, transplanting in the field, so like, for example, if you change your mind, like within a year um, before they put on too much mass, yes, that is possible, you know, as long as, um, you know, you don't really mince up the roots too bad uh, while while moving it. It is it's not out of the realm of possibility. All right, great. Thanks so much, Vasily. All right, uh, Hal, you want to um, bring up Cassie's video and Cassie, you want to tell and, and also introduce John, who shows up uh, in your video, too. Yes, for sure. I actually have a screen share really fast because I don't talk about a, I don't give that much of an intro uh, in my talk. OK, assume you can see that. Um, I am, yes, I'm Cassie Stark. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Science Coordinator located in Charlottesville, Virginia. And the videos are of myself and John Scarvani, who is the Virginia chapter president. Um, he's many things. He wears many hats. Um, but he also had a long career at the Virginia Department of Forestries. Um, so bare roots are what we're going to be talking about. And these are essentially exactly what they sound like. So they are seedlings sold without any soil um, and not in a container. So there's a photo of a bare root. These are typically planted in large seed beds and lifted when they are dormant, when the trees are dormant. And you also plant these uh, seedlings when trees are dormant. So they're very similar to planting um, containerized seedlings, except for the way that they come. Um, uh, with their roots exposed. And the main thing about bare roots, um, you want to store them after they've been lifted in a cool place. So kind of same with stratifying your seeds, usually in a cooler um, between 34 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. You can also keep them in your fridge or some people keep them in a cool basement. Um, you want to get them in the ground about six weeks after they've been lifted. <clears throat> um, and you can push that a little bit. We just had a planting on Monday um, and we pushed that a little bit, but that's kind of the time frame that you want to shoot for. But the main thing with bare roots is that you don't want your root system to dry out. So you want those roots to be kept moist. They usually come um, in a box kind of wrapped in plastic and usually the distributor or the nursery will wet down the roots before they send them to you. I would recommend keeping them in the packaging for as long as you can until right before you have to plant them. So those roots are staying moist. Um, there's lots of debate about 
uh, soak your roots for 24 hours, bare roots before you plant them or soak them for an hour before you plant them or four hours or lots of different things. Um, and the gist is don't let your roots dry out because once they are dried out, there's no rehydrating them. Um, so that's really the one big thing you have to be aware of when you're planting bare roots. So when you're in the field, um, I do recommend putting them in a bucket of water if it's a hot day or a windy day or you're transporting them um, in any way that you're going to want to be keeping the roots moist. So with that, we can go to the video. So we are planting our bare roots in a hole that we have dug with our auger. So we've made the hole wide enough to accommodate the entire root system. And we wanna make sure that the hole is deep enough so that our roots aren't folding in on themselves and kind of ewing and coming back up. So we wanna get our tree in the ground. And something really important that we want to do is make sure that our root collar is lined up um, with the surface of the ground. And so one way to do that and make sure you're really accurate is with a tool, just laying out your shovel or whatever you're using um, on the ground and just making sure that it winds up with your root collar. That's a really easy way. So then we're just going to pack fill with all of our soil that we've got here. I'm just using my hands. If you want to use a shovel or something, you can. Almost full. Okay, and then once my hole is full, I want to tamp down the soil to make sure I don't have any pockets, because um, sometimes you'll have pockets and water will compile in them. Um, so we're just going to kind of do like this, and then I'm going to come back with my feet you I'm just kind of tamp this down. All right, and that's how you plant a bare root in a hole. Very similar to planting a seedling, a containerized seedling in a hole. I'd like to show you four types of tool, hand tools that can be used to plant bare root seedlings. Uh, start with this uh, fairly standard shovel that you get at most garden centers, uh, and that uh, can be quite useful. Uh, a little more advanced is a, a specialized tool, tool for, for forestry called a dibble bar. And uh, it uh, goes in the ground, you know, a little extra thumbs to it. And a rock, of course, but it'll work through the rocks better than a shovel. Another tool is very similar, uh, but designed more for water seedlings like chestnuts typically are compared to pine seedlings. It's a KVC tool. It's a little bit bigger, heftier version of two handles or two uh, foot steps. Works the same way, working back and forth, working down. And you can need to make the treads. Uh, the slit trench a little wider, you can get it again. In addition to big, drawing a big round hole to accommodate a large seedling, if you have smaller seedlings, you can use a, a, tri a slit trench uh, approach. And I open this slit trench with this KVC tool uh, just wide enough for the seedling. Uh, so let me grab the seedling out of the bucket and uh, to the size of that seedling. It's going to fit in fairly easily. And we want to get it down the root collar, which is about there. And then closing the slit trench is a little different than the uh, bigger hole method. If you go again with your uh, planting tool, flat side this way, go all the way down to the depth of the hole, go back, pull back to close the bottom of the hole, and then pull up to close the top of the hole. And this was done with two uh, insertions of the tool, so I'll do the same 
and close it from the bottom, go back to close it, and then slip trench, you just kind of tamp it down. And if you want, try to fill in the hole behind you, but it's not that important. And so that is a quick and easy way with smaller suits. All right. Great job, Cassie. Thanks for doing that and for roping John into it. He's he's planted his fair share of seedlings uh, yeah. throughout his his days. Uh, Jay asks, should you wait six weeks or is sooner always better? Uh, I think sooner is likely better, um, but that's kind of like the maximum. Maximum, you can push it a little bit. Sometimes they get like white mold growing on them if you wait longer than six weeks. And usually you can kind of just rinse that off. Um, but yeah, you kind of want to be within that time frame. You don't have to wait six weeks. Sooner is better. Yeah, I agree. Um, Clark says, doesn't the dibble tool or slit trench planting method compact the soil alongside the seedling, making it harder for the roots to penetrate? Oof. I don't know the answer to that. I would say yes, which is why we, I, I think John mentioned a couple of times, we generally don't use this for, yeah. for chestnuts. Um, I mean, you can, and I have used it. I would say, you know, Clark, to your, to your point, you know, if you're in a sandy or very light soil, a, a um, light density or light texture soil, it'd be okay to use something like that. If you're in a, in a clay or soil, obviously we don't want to plant in clay, um, but I would generally recommend against a, a, a tool like that for, for most hardwood seedlings and, and chestnut in particular. Vasily, you showed up. Does that mean you have a comment on this, I hope? No? No, I agree. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a tool designed for planting lots and lots of trees really fast. And if you, unless you're planting lots and lots of trees really fast and you don't have the time, you know, the more time and attention you can give them, the, the more successful they'll be. Good point, Kendra. Um, I got a couple questions here about shade. Um, so maybe Cassie, wh what do you think about that? I, I've got, do plantings need full sun? How much shade can you give them? Et cetera, et cetera. Full sun is best um, if you want your trees to especially flower and grow fast. Um, something that you'll see in the shade, if you have a really shady area, is you may have a chestnut that makes it and is big and has made it to the age of reproduction or five to seven years, but isn't flowering. Um, and that could be due to a lack of sunlight. So that's something you certainly want to consider. Uh, chestnuts are species that like disturbance. Um, so gaps are certainly preferred. So they, they prefer a lot of sunlight. But you can get away. They are shade tolerant. They're semi shade shade tolerant, so you can get away with planting them in the shade. Yeah, they'll just they'll hang out there until they get a they get a uh, an opening. <laughs> yeah. Um. Is there a good way to keep the roots moist? On uh, Holly asks, is there a good way to keep the roots roots moist on bare roots if you have to hold them for a few weeks? Um, I would recommend just keeping them in whatever original packaging you got. I mean, usually they come in like a plastic or with like you could wrap like a wet paper towel, very moist, like not sopping wet, but like kind of damp paper towel around them. But usually when they're sent to you, they'll be kind of sprayed down before they're sent um, so that you can store them for, you know, a little bit of period of time if you need to. Um, so I would just recommend keeping them in their original packaging and not moving them and leaving them out just kind of like in the in the open air and you want to be keeping them in a cool place too so like i said your refrigerator or like a damp basement um, is sometimes an easy place to store them uh, last question here and then i'll go on to really quickly cover overwintering seedlings uh, john says this they're in the ground now but the seedlings that he got from the sale he kept in a refrigerator for over a week is that acceptable yeah Agreed. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so I did not uh, thank you guys. Um, but I know we're almost at one o'clock here. I do want to cover overwintering seedlings. I'm going to for those who do need to leave at one. Um, I want to thank everybody here. You guys put in a ton of work making these videos. I didn't. I'm sorry. Hal did an incredible job. Um, editing all of that. Hal, thank you, especially the speeding up of things. That was fun and and helping with the captioning. That was that was excellent work. The the music you chose was was very fun, and I did my little chair dance every time it came on. Um, next month, uh, next so May seventeenth, we're inviting Fred Paille. He's going to talk about uh, his observations of European chestnut in Europe. Um, 
Let me go ahead and share my screen here. I'm going to talk really quickly about overwintering chestnuts because I get uh, a question about that quite a bit. And I saw a few of the questions in the Q&A about that as well, about um, how you know um, how you know when to over, overwinter them. Or I had a couple of people say that they they lost their seedlings over winter. So the main thing that you have to know about overwintering seedlings at kind of like um, uh, keeping your seeds in the refrigerator is you want to keep those temperatures low. You want to keep them as close to freezing as you can without actually freezing them. So between 33 and 40 is ideal. Uh, if you go over 40 degrees in, in an area, they, they won't stay dormant or they won't go dormant or they um, will flush out too quickly. And then you have to plant um, a, a succulent a tree after the fear of frost. So keeping them dormant um, as long as possible is kind of the key here when you're overwintering them. Um, the second key is that you don't want the roots to freeze. So what you're seeing here is actually a shade house uh, here at, at Penn State. You see the, the snow on the seedlings. These are the one gallon um, citrus pots that Sierra had talked about in her talk. Typically we can keep these outside in central PA without the roots freezing. Um, so uh, sometimes we will keep these one gallon pots in a five gallon pot. We've had no problems with five gallon pots, keeping them out the entire winter and just overwintering them outside. Anything smaller than this one gallon pot here in central PA, the roots will freeze and the tree will die. So it's not the above ground portion that you're worrying about freezing. It's the below ground portion that you're worrying about freezing. Um, here we go. So where do you keep them? If the pots are large enough, you can keep them outside. They'll be fine. If temperatures don't reach freezing or go below freezing, if you're in the deep south, you don't have to worry about it. Just keep them outside. Um, there are things called cold frames. Um, those are basically just holes in the ground uh, that you then cover. And we actually have a cold frame here on campus that I've used with great success. But again, you know, you may not have a hole in the ground that you can just throw your, your uh, pots in, or it may not be big enough to put a whole bunch of pots in. Um, but usually those are insulated well enough that, that it'll keep the roots from freezing. If you want to keep them inside, um, unheated garages can off, often work uh, well enough. Again, you want to keep those roots from freezing. You can keep them in a cold basement, although often the temperatures do go above 40. And again, they'll go dormant, they'll stay dormant, but not for a long time. That's what you're fighting against in a warmer area. Um, we keep ours typically in a greenhouse with moderated temperatures. Um, our temps are a little higher than I'd like. Uh, we do typically have them um, flush too soon. Um, usually our trees are flushed by February which means we have to keep them and, and plant them as um, flush seedlings in, in mid to late May or early June. And then you have um, issues with, with watering the trees. What you see here is, is in a greenhouse that was completely unheated. You'll see these are the D40 containers that, that Sierra mentioned in her, in her talk too. These D40s you cannot keep outside, at least not here in central PA. The roofs will freeze, the trees will die. Um, you'll see here in, in a greenhouse, the, the pipes actually burst um, and so what we had to do was um, create this tarped structure inside the greenhouse. We put a space heater in it uh, to keep the roots from freezing. Uh, we spent about uh, two weeks in this kind of contraption to keep the seedlings from freezing, um, but then also to keep them um, uh, through the winter. You'll see a couple of other contraptions that we've used here on campus. Um, here is a, a glass house, um, and I'm not actually sure what that is about is there for but uh, again this greenhouse typically in the in the in the winter time is between 33 and 35 it warms up a little bit too quickly we get we get flush seedlings but again you see these pots are three to five gallons uh, my preference for that size pot would be to keep it outside um, and then over here is sort of the equivalent of a cold frame even though it's it's above ground um, but it's an unheated space big pots um, you could actually probably keep these outside and they'd be fine um, uh, Last kind of thing that you can do if you don't want to keep it um, inside uh, or, and, and you know that the roots might freeze if your pot's not big enough, you can actually do something called healing in. Um, and you can do this with your bare root trees as well. Um, you, can, uh, you can take that pot and you can just plant it in the ground, especially if your ground doesn't freeze solid for a long period of time in the winter. So um, that's a really good, um, a really good way uh, to keep the the seedlings alive through the spring. So again, you're you're uh, you're fighting against the root mass freezing. Uh, that's what you're trying to prevent. So uh, get a big pot, insulate the pot. Um, I've seen people too uh, create like a, a cage, put the pot in it, and then fill it with blankets and 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 mulch or dirt or um, leaves, and that helps insulate the pot and keep it from freezing.
Um, so I will end there, see if we have any final questions. Um, well, Sarah, I just took one because we were pretty much at the end of the time, but um, someone was asking about water requirements for dormant oh. seedlings over the winter. Um, generally, I don't water at all in, in the oh. winter and we don't have any problem. Do you, Kendra? I do. Oh, you do? Very lightly, like once a month, but yeah. minimally. Um, when I've ignored them completely, they have not liked that. But oh. I also, I overwinter in a cold, in a cool greenhouse once they're dormant. Um, so I think it might be a, a balance of how cold a site, you know, or, or your overwintering environment is. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, um, I, I think that's it for a majority of, of the program. Um, thank you all. We've had so many great questions. We'll work on trying to formulate some, um, obviously you'll get the recording. We'll try and put together a lot of these great questions and this great chat into some sort of format so that you guys can check it out, uh, search it. We also have FAQs um, online that cover like real quick summaries of these techniques as well. Um, so uh, until next month again. I, I have a quick just... plug, oh, Sarah. Absolutely. Really quick. Yeah. Cast um, the Virginia Department of Forestry is where I shot my video, the Augusta Nursery, does have bare root hybrid chestnut seedlings for sale that they are trying to kind of get rid of. So if you are interested, it's buyvatrees.com and I will throw it into the chat. Thanks, Cassie. And um, I actually saw someone in the chat said, can they go pick up seedlings at the Virginia DOF or Augusta Nursery in person? Is that allowed? You need to contact them um, and have like order beforehand. It's not like a, like you don't go shop there. You order it and then you can pick up your seedlings there. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, good. Thanks for that that plug, Cassie. Sierra, Kendra, Vasily, Cassie, Hal, Lake, Catherine. Thank you all. This was excellent. I really enjoyed it. We had so much great engagement. Thank you all. We had almost 300 people join us today. That was really fantastic. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you guys next month. Have a great weekend.